All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to IGTV. Uh, with us is uh, Mark Capers. And Mark, uh, why don't you get on to it? Uh, overview of methods and processes for vulnerability compliance and penetration scanning. Man, I hope you have enough time to cover this. Uh, so, <laughs> I, could take, I could take all day on this. Uh, so this is going to be a very rapid uh, speech, so I'm glad I had the strong coffee this morning. Uh, I wanted to give a, a quick overview of uh, different types of scanning regimes typically found in organizations. And again, I'm modeling on the practical InfoSec, right tool for the right job. Just run through quickly uh, some of the different types that uh, I've used in the past and how they differ and how they actually tend to overlap and build on each other. So jumping into it, uh, the different types of scans typically break down into network discovery and port scanning, vulnerability scanning, penetration testing, and compliance management scanning. Um, and again, with all these types of scans, when you're when you're building out these processes, it's important to understand what your communication and and your pre-planning for each type needs. Typically, in a lot of organizations, especially ones that are are under certain types of regulations, scanning either by policy or by regulatory is now a frequent activity. Um, PCI requires quarterly scans. Um, SOX requires different postures, and typically, a lot of Mature organizations require at least semi-annual or annual scanning of some type. So while you're setting those up, make sure you understand that while you're doing this activity or while you have a scan team or a third party, if you outsource this to uh, software as a service or some other consulting firms, you need to make sure that you work with your network management group and your incident response group so they're aware that people are doing scans and where they are coming from and you need to work with your scanners to get the technical information to the people who respond to incidents because many organizations and several ones that I've been involved with, if we detect scanning with our IDS systems or other uh, security systems, we treat it as an incident unless otherwise you know, posted on the scan schedule. So it's important to make sure you have that communications and escalation process in place. Um, quickly talking about the network scans, in a lot of smaller or medium companies, it's easy to lose sight of what's on your network. And network scans, particularly discovery scans, um, are a great way of mapping out that network and making validating the systems that you think are on your network or on your network and that systems that ought not to be on your network aren't there. Um, a lot of these are typically commercial, uh, supported by commercial scan tools when you get into vulnerability scanning usually that requires a commercial tool of some type or a vendor software service. Uh, but there are some shareware open source tools available. Netcat and Nmap are, are two very, very popular and very robust and well-known tools that everybody should have in their tool bag, regardless of the other tools you have. Um, again, with the discovery scan, you should also be doing this on your wireless network. And whether it's wired or wireless, you can use discovery and ping scanning to find rogue systems on your network. Um, typically, a lot of times you can also combine this with port scanning, which is actually scanning the ports of each found host uh, to determine what services are running. So, you know, if you have, you know, to use this to detect not rogue systems or services, you would look for non-assigned IP addresses if you're scanning a segment that's a server farm and you assign all the IP addresses to your uh, servers, then anything that's not on there that responds is is a problem that you need to investigate. Uh, likewise, both with wireless and uh, wired networks, if you maintain um, a, a common office environment or, you know, in the case of wireless, a lot of times you'll have MAC restrictions. But if you see MAC addresses that don't belong on your network, if you're a Dell shop, for instance, all MAC addresses have a manufacturer specific preface, the thir first three octets are basically per manufacturer. If you're a Dell shop and you start seeing non-Dell MAC addresses, that may be an indication of some, a problem. Um, likewise, you know, if you, if you have a really good asset management system, that's a good way to say, okay, well, if we do a scan, we'll pull all the MAC addresses and then run a script against your asset management program to see if there are any mismatches. Um, likewise, uh, if you're running port scans, even on a workstation and you know a LAN segment out in, in your offices uh, where your users are, 
it's a good idea to run port scans on occasion because occasionally you'll find things like, you know, if, if a laptop's running an FTP server, you want to know about that because it's probably an issue. Um, before we get into vulnerabilities uh, scanning, um, I'm going to spend a couple seconds talking about, you know, vulnerability and exposure definitions. I'm using MITRE's common vulnerability and exposure definitions, um, and MITRE is an organization that is supported by NIST and the Department of Homeland Security. They have a common nomenclature for vulnerabilities. So regardless of what vulnerability scanning tool you're using, typically it translates to these the vulnerabilities found in either the NIST database or the CVE database, and they're great, great resources uh, for you to use to determine what, you know, if you have an infected system or you're worried about a vulnerability, it's a great way to get the skinny on what it really means to your system and, and how it manifests itself on different types of hosts. Um, so basically, vulnerability is a mistake in the software. A, a issue that allows a hacker to gain access to a system or a network. Um, it, it's basically the threshold is if it allows an attacker to violate a reasonable security policy for a system. Um, typically, you know, allows attacker to execute as another user, uh, allows attacker access to data that violates the the ACL of the machine, uh, allows an attacker to pose another as another entity or you know, even uh, allows denial of service. Um, I'll, I'll put up a CVE link um, after the chat, and you can go look up the terminology yourself. I highly recommend it. Um, moving through into vulnerability scanning, it, vulnerability scanning is basically the workhorse of the scanning world. Most of the stuff that we all do with network assessments, with scanning and compliance and penetration, vulnerability is really where a lot of the meat is. Um, and that basically, it's it's a commercial tool typically, or software as a service, or a lot of smaller or medium firms will outsource that to another vendor to do. Um, typically, the vulnerability scanner is used to validate a system or you know determine a system's vulnerability either through bad patching or you know known vulnerabilities. Again, it, going back to the MITRE database, if there is a known vulnerability, typically the vulnerability scanner will have a library to look at different things on a system and determine if it's if it's vulnerable. It works kind of analogous to virus software or intrusion protection software. Um, typically, it should be, you know, vulnerability scanning is a great kind of Swiss Army knife in the security world. You need to be able to use it, and I, I always recommend that, that ha you know, security people, especially incident response people, have access to a vulnerability scanning uh, for their work because after you clean up after an incident, one of the things you want to do to make sure that your remediation took effect correctly is you go back and you rescan for the vulnerabilities or for the hack and make sure that you can't access that system with a vulnerability scanner and that ensures that whatever fix you put in place uh, works. Um, typically it's sold as either hardware software, com combination appliance, software as a service, uh, some popular ones, uh, Nessus, Qualys, uh, EI's Retina, um, IBM Preventia Suite. Uh, basically, they, IBM bought out ISS from uh, years ago, and that's under the Preventia name now. Um, typically, the hallmarks of vulnerability scanning, it's non-intrusive and non-credentialed in most instances. Um, so, you know, the vulnerability scanner, generally for most vulnerability scans, I would recommend putting it in the, the least knockover setting that you can uh, rather than trying to do brute force and give it credentials to actually try to log into the system. That's typically something that hackers do do, but that's not going to demonstrate the vulnerabilities on your system as long as you have good policies around that stuff. And you'd le want to leave that for your compliance and your penetration work. Um, so the vulnerability scanning tests not only the the OS, a lot of times it'll test middleware and applications and databases. Again, depending upon what tool you select, you may need to get add-on modules for that particular technology that you're using. Um, generally, with the vulnerability scanning process, you're going to, you know, because vulnerability scanning is a pretty comprehensive scan, you're only going to scan for known hosts. You, if you have a server farm and you say, we've got to do this bunch of web servers, you're only going to give the IP of those web services. Uh, rather than just sort of let it loose on a network, um, which can drain your bandwidth. Um, 
after you do the vulnerability scan, that will give you some good insight into how your patch management process is working or not working. And depending upon what you find, you have to then go create a remediation plan and execute that with your systems administrators. Um, and so this is vulnerability scan is very tied into your patch management process. Um, kind of moving to the next level, penetration testing. I would differentiate penetration testing as a much more project oriented activity. Um, typically it's much more internal and external scanning. You're going to scan for both internal and external. And a lot, a lot of times it, it tests the real world security. So depending upon how desperate you are or how <laughs> serious you need to test that, it's going to determine how aggressively you do your penetration testing. Um, and again, I, I talk about alerting the appropriate entities that you're doing these types of tests and certain types of penetration tests you may be testing to see how your incident response works. So in that regard, you may alert the management of incident response that you're going to be doing this, and then everybody sits back and watch how, how that goes. Um, again, with penetration testing, typically you do use credentialed access. So you're going to go after administrator, SA, root, guest, all that stuff. There could be you know, a, an attempt to brute force and crack user accounts. Um, you would typically also look at physical security. Sometimes, you know, you combine the penetration test with physical security assessment and you actually try to walk in and, and, and break into the systems unannounced at, at a given branch office or something like that. Uh, you can also test, you know, your social engineering vulnerabilities by phishing or spear phishing attempts. Um, walking through the penetration testing process Typically, you've got several phases involved, and this is walking through kind of the, the different grades of scanning, you know, starting out with reconnaissance. Sometimes, sometimes actually, you tell your penetration testers, all right, assume you know nothing about the organization, go out, find out whatever's publicly available, and then exploit that. Now, other times, you might have a B team that says, okay, you've got the inside skinny, go after everything that you know that's there, internal or external. Use the internal knowledge to test from external. Um, so you do discovery scanning, you do the footprinting and port detection, you then do vulnerability scanning, then you start doing enumeration, which is, you know, trying to ascertain what user IDs are out there and what are available for you to try to break into. Um, after you do those two things, you start doing some vulnerability mapping and exploitation. The vulnerabilities that you find, then you need to take a second cycle and say, okay, well, we found these vulnerabilities. Let's see if we can actually go exploit them and gain access. Um, and again, this is where you need to do some good project management, project planning ahead of time to say, what are our limits with doing this? A lot of vulnerability scanning engagements that I've been involved with, sometimes you're asked to put physical evidence on the machine, either by a text file to say, read me, hey, we were here, we got in, or something else. And other times, you don't want to exploit things too badly because that requires then a proper remediation and in some case proper remediation means if you put a trojan on it to break the system you then have to wipe that system to ensure that it's gone and that creates a a rather uh, lengthy and expensive uh, recovery process just for a test um, so be aware of those things um, again physical and wireless perimeter access uh, are, are often engaged in this. Uh, you know, if you if you sometimes you drive around. Uh, I've done a lot of factory plants where you try to find rogue wireless access points, and you and you see how tough it is to you know walk onto the factory floor, or walk onto the facilities without being challenged. Uh, and again, that gets into the phishing uh, penetration testing as well. And then after all that, you've got to do the results uh, analysis and, and reporting. And a lot of times you're on the hook to help manage the remediation of all this stuff. Um, so as you find things that are broken, you kind of got to help them fix it. Um, and all that kind of ties back into uh, the last thing I'll talk about is compliance management and scanning. Um, compliance regime is something that we're all very, very involved with. And for, for those of us who work in organizations that have regulatory requirements, whether it's PCI, SOX, FDA, et cetera, we spend a lot of our life trying to comply with those regulations and the organization has to come up with a posture to, work to, to comply with them. And scanning is typically a very big part of that because that is how you demonstrate your compliance. So it's used to demonstrate 
you know, vulnerability scanning especially is used to demonstrate compliance with policy. Now, I can't do it alone. Typically, you need policy compliance tools um, that actually test how your policies are implemented out of box. Vulnerability scans will not tell you how good your password, you know, if, you, if you're setting a box password length of 16 characters, vulnerability scan won't tell you that. However, a compliance tool will. Vulnerability scan will tell you is if you have a guest that doesn't require a password. Um, so, again, that's sort of a marriage between your patch management process, your compliance management, and and scanning. Um, and a lot of times, compliance scanning is done at a given frequency, quarterly, semi-annually, and it typically targets a specific set of technologies and a set of compliance postures. Um, I'll have more on this uh, stuff. Uh, I've got some uh, lists of uh, network scanning tools and some of their ratings uh, from uh, Insecure, SANS, and NIST. Uh, I've got some white papers on vulnerability scanning and how to create a patch management and vulnerability scanning program from NIST, as well as I will include links to the Common Vulnerabilities Database at MITRE and the NIST National Vulnerability um, database as well as uh, the PCI standards library.